this is the data home sales uh, from 2018, essentially pre-pandemic, 2019 pre-pandemic, um, then 2020. That red line is to illustrate what it was before the pandemic. Now this data is national. Uh, Lehigh Valley was actually showing a little better trend before the pre-pandemic, seeing slight uh, gains year over year. But uh, for nationwide, essentially moving sideways, little up, little down, no meaningful change, and then the lockdown. And what a scary moment uh, first related to the virus. You know, remember they said, don't touch your face accidentally. Uh, and, you know, people are very scared. Uh, also, all the business activities shutting down. You know, what's going to happen? Are we going to face another foreclosure crisis as something that happened back in 2008, 2009, 2010? Uh, so we really did not know. But as you can see in the chart, once the lockdown was lifted, sales not only recovered, but it went way beyond the uh, pre-pandemic level, just simply surge. I mentioned about the low interest rates, but other factors could be that, well, people do not want to stay in high dense area. So whether from Philadelphia, New York City, they're saying, no, there are too many people uh, congregated. I want a little uh, elbow room uh, uh, to space out. The other factor, Fortunately, America had high-speed internet access, therefore for office workers who, who have been fairly immune during the COVID crisis, the office workers could work from home and therefore they needed larger space housing unit. And some people wanted to take advantage and their home sales really boom. But note what's happening in the latest month. The momentum is losing. So we are beginning to show some top out pattern. This is sales, not prices. As you know, prices are going straight up, but the sales are actually beginning to show some loss of momentum. It is still up from one year ago. So it is still above the pre-pandemic uh, conditions, but less strongly, only in a single digit percentage uh, increase compared to say 20 or 30% unit sales activity of growth that we saw in the autumn winter months of last year. Another data point uh, that is of interest uh, is that mortgage application to buy a home is beginning to slide below the pre-pandemic conditions. So this is from, I guess, early 2020. So that's the starting point that you see that dip during the lockdown, then it came out going above pre-pandemic but note now we are going below pre-pandemic because certainly mortgage application is one of the first early signals about potential closing activity. Now, why is this happening? Well, home prices are so high that some first time buyers are simply getting priced out. They thought they had a down payment, but now it's becoming irrelevant uh, given the price increases. Uh, the other factor is given the very competitive multiple offer situation, only way buyers can stand out among other competitors is to say, look, I have all cash. You can remove the mortgage contingency. And hence, the buyers are somehow able to come up uh, with their cash for those fortunate enough to say, uh, borrow temporarily from family members you know, to gather the cash or maybe they're depleting their retirement funds. Uh, whatever it is, we are seeing more cash offers now, uh, even though the mortgage application is going down. Now, we also know that there are many families who have no option other than to get a mortgage, and they are at a disadvantaged position in the current competitive multiple offer situation. Aside from affordability, aside from the mortgage application going down. Another part that is frustrating buyers is simply there's not enough homes for sale. This is a record low inventory. Now we are seeing slightly more inventory in the recent months compared to the winter months, but that happens all the time. But look at the historical chart. We don't have enough homes for sale. 
Uh, and unless we have more homes for sale, we may continue to face this clogging, clogging activity of home sales. Home sales simply cannot move along. Just do a hypothetical. In your neighborhood, if you had 20% more listings, would you have 20% more home sales? And I will say most people are just nodding their head and say, yeah, certainly we have buyers, 20% more inventory, 20% more home sales. So home sales would be higher if we had more inventory. Let's look at the price category and where the inventory is most acutely short. And it is on the lower price points. At less than 100,000, significantly lower inventory. Then you go into the 100 and 250, that's what the first time buyers are looking at, not enough inventory. But as you move up the price points, you begin to see that inventory is not as significantly short, or in the case of million dollar plus, we actually have more homes available for sale. And let's look at where the sales are clicking and not clicking. Sales are clicking along in a million dollar plus because there is inventory. Even on the upper end, because inventory declines are more modest. But where we don't have inventory, lower price points, sales are not moving. And that is why it is critical that we bring more inventory. And also everything is related. If we have more inventory, prices will not shoot up so high. So it makes affordability more manageable. So it all goes down to having more inventory come onto the market. So why do we have housing shortage? By the way, you have an apartment shortage in the Lehigh Valley uh, region. I mean, very uh, significant shortage on the apartment. So it's not only about home ownership, uh, lack of inventory, uh, but on the rental side. And this is the chart that illustrates why we have housing shortage in America across all, uh, pretty much all uh, metro markets, all states. 1960 onwards, some years little down, other years much higher, but not persistent, not for a long period. You know, sometimes up, sometimes down, indicating housing market uh, is a cyclical business. But look what has happened from 2007, eight period. We have been underproducing. Now, there was a foreclosure crisis, so we should not be producing during that time period. But even as we are coming out of the recession, builders never came out. They were under the historical average for 14 straight years. And the cumulative effect of underproduction over many years in a country where we have a rising population, well, we have a housing shortage. The final two red bars that you see is only a forecast what I think will happen on housing starts this year and next year. Directionally, we are improving, but is it sufficient to eliminate all this shortage? And the answer is no. Uh, and hence, uh, you know, we have this housing shortage, apartment shortage, rental housing shortage. So housing shortage uh, conditions, uh, which means that prices will be rising and also the rents will be rising uh, anytime you have this shortage. You know, one other thing that we are uh, talking with the members of Congress uh, along with the White House uh, is to discuss this once in a generation housing shortage and to see whether or not the infrastructure spending. Now, now we all know that infrastructure spending for bridges, highway, all, all needed. You know, you think about the Lincoln Tunnel, able to build road under the water from New Jersey to Manhattan. Uh, build the bridges that goes all the way to the Key West, uh, building uh, the, the highways up in the sky. Uh, I live in Virginia. In Virginia, there's something called a Skyline Drive. And I'm sure I drove through the highway near your region and it feels like you are driving along the sky as well. Uh, so all this infrastructure spending was part of that Great Depression to get people who didn't have jobs back to work uh, but now we need more spending on infrastructure just to upgrade so that you know, the buildings don't collapse, bridges don't collapse, so we need it. But there are also many other components that people think is not part of the infrastructure and that should be discarded or not, you know, that's debate. Uh, but one thing that we are relaying to Congress is that 
maybe some of the infrastructure spending could be for housing. Money dedicated to uh, rehabilitate or make it habitable some of the very old housing units. So it doesn't have to be building new homes, but trying to upgrade uh, old homes. Or what about those empty shopping malls? Can we convert it into some kind of mixed use, part condominium, part office spaces? Uh, you know, maybe some uh, way, uh, but there is not enough funds to do that. So either government funding or some government tax credits so the private sector can get involved. We are in a housing shortage. So we need to consider all options as to how to boost uh, additional supply. Now, let me turn to the mortgage rates because mortgage rates are definitely coming off their bottom. Your clients who bought home last year, congratulate them. They got 2.7%, absolute low points. Today's clients are no longer able to tap into that. Average mortgage rates are around 3%. So why is the mortgage rate rising, even though the Federal Reserve is saying, we're not doing any changes, so we're not uh, changing anything. So the red line is the mortgage rates, and the green line is the Federal Reserve, central bank. They have pressing on the gas pedal. We are at a zero interest rate condition from the Federal Reserve perspective. But what is that middle line, blue line that is beginning to rise? Well, the middle line is the 10-year treasury yield, the interest rate that US government pays to borrow money. And we are in a high deficit, highest national debt condition. And therefore, some of the people who are lending money to the US government is saying, look, I'm getting nervous about your deficit. Only way I can begin to fund your deficit is you have to pay me slightly higher interest rates. So when the blue line rises, red line automatically rises. Put simply, stimulus, 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 a good portion is to fix the economy. Good portion is to fix things the American need. But then other components of the stimulus, one has to wonder, is it simply raising the budget deficit without really providing good return for the future, uh, and hence just raising the interest rates? No, those are all debatable points. You know, Washington is going over it, but just trying to illustrate stimulus is not a free lunch. And the cost is coming in terms of higher blue line, higher interest rate the government is paying. And now it is beginning to filter up into the mortgage rates. Another thing that will push up mortgage rates is that inflation is beginning to pick up. We're all concerned about inflation because we go to grocery store. And we are facing sticker shock. The meat price is up 10% from one year ago. Used car prices, because of the automobile shortages, I mean, prices are rising about 20% on the used car. On the gasoline, where the realtors spend more money compared to general population, it is at a six year high in terms of gasoline. So inflation is popping out and it's a huge irritant. It's eating away at your pocketbook, but it also has an impact for your potential home buyers. Anytime we have high inflation, mortgage rate will also rise. Go back to the 1970s. Millennial generation have no idea about the 1970s. Every time you go to grocery store, anything you purchase, it became 10% higher the next time you went. And during, during that time period, mortgage rates were 14%, 15%, 18%. Millennial generation have no idea the mortgage rate could be that high. So why was the mortgage rate that high in the 1970s? Because when the lender, when the banks are lending that money, well, the money that will be returned at future years would have lost value. The purchasing power is simply not there. So the lender said, look, why should I lend you the money at 2% interest rate when the inflation is eating up all that money? So only way to make a decent business decision is that if inflation is high, interest rate should also be high. So right now, inflation is popping out and this could pressure mortgage rates to rise even higher down the road. Don't be surprised, by Christmas of this year, mortgage rates uh, average 3.5% from current 
because of higher budget deficit and the fact that inflation is beginning to pop out. We have more inflation along the pipeline. This is the producer prices, not the consumer prices for construction material, lumber, cement. You know, you have to get the foundation in, drywall, copper, all that part uh, is rising. And I'm sure that some of your recent home buyers are also uh, facing difficulty in buying appliances. You know, appliance prices are rising. So there's a, a more pipeline pressure to push up the inflation. And again, if inflation pops out, you can push up mortgage rates independent of whatever the Federal Reserve is trying to do. Rents, in the meantime, were rising 4% a year before the pandemic. Then it decelerated, come down to only 2%, because when the initial pandemic hit, we had 20 million job losses. Many people working at a restaurant, hotel, generally renters, they lost jobs, so they went straight to their parents' basement or double up with somebody else. And as the rental demand collapsed and the rents began to decelerate, but this will soon come back up to 4%. I'm very positive of that. Why is that? Well, because of this. This is the number of rental uh, households. What you see is that there are renters and then during the pandemic, rental demand collapsed as people went to the basement. But now with jobs recovery, people are popping out of the basement, seeking out their own apartment units. So as this rises, it is just inevitable that rents will go back up to the pre-pandemic 4% growth rate. So that is a rental expectation. I know many realtors also have a second property, investment property. You are wondering what's gonna happen. And also we are uh, very concerned about this eviction moratorium being extended and extended again. Uh, if there is an eviction moratorium, we want to at least assure that there is a rental subsidy. I mean, you cannot leave landlords or housing providers out dry, uh, unable to collect rent. Uh, you know, that's completely unfair. Uh, so if they are going to extend eviction moratorium, uh, then at least uh, they should provide rental subsidy to the housing provider because it's simply unfair to say you cannot evict somebody who is not paying rent. Uh, and you know, this is a simple redistribution uh, of wealth uh, within the country uh, with the landlords suffering. Uh, I understand that people who need rental subsidy, so get that rental subsidy in, uh, but don't say no eviction without the rental subsidy. You know, that just simply does not make any sense. Uh, but the jobs are recovering, so hopefully uh, many uh, renters uh, who are in difficult circumstance are able to find a job and, and get back current on their rents. Now let's turn to the job market. This is the US job market, and then I will compare with the Lehigh Valley area. From year 2000, so from year 2000, some job creation right up to the, uh, the housing market bubble, then we had a foreclosure crisis, so we lost all that jobs. But from the low point in 2010, America experienced the longest job expansion ever. 10 straight years of consistent job creation. President of the United States always gets too much of the credit and too much of the blame for economic activity. But if you want to say, you can say President Obama, President Trump period, amazing 10 straight years of job creation. Right before the pandemic, lowest unemployment rate in a generations across Ethnic category, white, Hispanic, uh, African-American, Asian, low unemployment rate across gender, male, female, low unemployment rate across age group, unemployment rate just low, low, low all, all across. But then the lockdown. And in a single month during the lockdown, we lost 10 years of progress. In a single month, all that job that was created in 10 year time frame gone, disappeared. The economy reopened, Jobs began to come around, but as you can see, we are nowhere back to the pre-pandemic level yet. Here is the job market in your area. So the uh, MSA area that is defined by census, which is Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton, uh, the job market looks like this. And the way to view it is, I like to come look at the red line as a base period for year 2000. So let me go back to the US. Look at the red line in the US. See how it touches in 2010, but
but you did not, which means that you actually had a faster job growth, better job market performance compared to the rest of the country. And let me go back to the US again. And in the uh, subsequent 10 years from 2010 to 2020, solid job grade, uh, creation in the US. But here you see that you are going below the red line during the lockdown. And maybe this is just simply that Pennsylvania had one of the strictest lockdown for a longer period and hence you suffer a little more in terms of jobs. But you are recovering uh, almost there to the pre-pandemic, not quite, but almost getting there. Let me show you the 50 states comparison. Pennsylvania down 6.0% now compared to pre-pandemic. And it is one of the more severe. I guess New York right across, uh, Governor Cuomo had, had even stricter lockdown. So they're down 8.6%. But if you look at other states, more light, uh, sort of the greenish uh, or bluish color uh, part, that is showing that they were down only lightly, not too much. Then you have Idaho and Utah where they actually have more jobs today compared to pre-pandemic. Because they really never shut down their business. Businesses were always open. I mean, people had to be careful you know, for a few weeks, uh, but they never shut down. So they actually have more jobs now compared to one year before. So you get different performance depending upon different policies on the lockdown. And of course, lockdown was not to try to hurt the businesses. It was trying to contain the coronavirus, uh, but you see uh, the sort of different uh, employment effect uh, depending on the governor policy uh, across the country. Job openings are at a record high today. 48 states are still not back up to the pre-pandemic yet job openings are at a record high. I am in Virginia or Washington DC suburbs. And when I walk around, I see help wanted signs, job openings, inquire, inquire within. Now many are you know, low wage industry jobs and you know, people may not be so interested, but nonetheless, those are jobs. So we have a record high job openings Yet 48 states are still under the pre-pandemic conditions. Why could it be? Well, people are saying generous unemployment benefits. If you provide incentive to stay home, well, people will stay at home. Other people are saying, well, they would like to get back to their job, but they simply could not because schools were closed and they have a school-aged kid, and they're not gonna leave their uh, kids at home by themselves. Uh, so school, school closing uh, forced them not to take on the job. And other people, you know, we perfectly understand the free decision about whether to get vaccinated or not. Some people who are hesitant about getting vaccination and afraid of COVID, but they don't want to interact with outside world. And hence, uh, you know, that could be also holding back uh, people coming back to the job. But however you want to view it, we have record high job openings, yet we don't have record high number of jobs. We are under uh, in terms of the people uh, with job with Pennsylvania down 6.0% from one year ago. Let me now go into the forecast to wrap it up. So home sales, given that we are still at a reasonably favorable mortgage rate, even if it goes up to 3.5%, it is still very favorable mortgage rates. And we are creating jobs. Maybe not fully, but we're at least moving in the right direction. So job creation is positive. 2021, home sales will pop out around 10% growth compared to one year before, the total. Year to date, I mean, you are doing well so far year to date, but in the, by the fourth quarter, you may be slightly light compared to last year. So you may actually come in slightly under in terms of unit sales, not prices. Prices are holding firm. Uh, so the uh, unit sales will be up about 10%. The easiest way to think about this is that you have 12 months of home sales this year. Last year, you did not have 12 months of home sales. And that is the uh, key difference. And my final uh, slide uh, is uh, that office leasing activity is not picking up even with jobs recovery. Because I think many CEOs really do not know whether or not to have five days a week come to office. Because I think it's gonna be a competitive labor environment uh, workers, office workers have demonstrated that could work from home. So it likely some kind of hybrid, come to office three days a week 
other two days, you could work from home or maybe first two weeks come to office, the remainder of the month, you can work from home. I don't know what the new model is. Uh, there will be a lot of trial and error, but independent, it just means that people do not have to be uh, so close to Philadelphia. People do not have to live so close to uh, New York City. They can live farther away knowing they don't have to commute as much. And if that's the case, you will be one of the biggest beneficiaries. People are saying, you know, why do I live in that small condominium near New York City when I can have a mansion in the Lehigh Valley and, uh, and understanding that I don't have to go to office every single day. So I think you will be a very big beneficiary of that trend. Oh, I do actually have one more uh, slide. Huh? The vacation home sales, Poconos, I mean, these Poconos are booming uh, and along with the other vacation resort centers. And this is a similar trend. Work from home can also mean work from vacation home. So again, uh, the trend away from major city centers uh, into outlying regions or more a quiet and pleasant region, I think that could be a new trend. And certainly you are in a position to benefit from this developing uh, conditions. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, and now uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, uh, Justin. Well, thank you so much. And that was such a great overview working down to our locale here. Um, any questions? Uh, would you entertain a few questions if there were, were any, if anyone- Oh yes, questions? I'm happy to take a few questions. Um, anyone have any questions? Uh, if you wanna put them in the chat portal, um, that would be great. And if we could all just mute ourselves just that we could hear Dr. Yoon wrap up. Um, any questions? You know, I, I actually have one question that comes from some of our brokers. You know, we're starting to see a lot of valuation creep up, as you know, uh, you know, really tied parallel with the um, inventory challenges that you addressed. Do you foresee any issues with, you know, are these the new norms of valuation kind of throughout the corridor? Or are we going to see five years from now some deviation in price? What's your thoughts of where, where prices are and where they're going to continue here in the future? Uh, the nationwide medium price, 350000 Lehigh Valley, slightly under that uh, part, and definitely much cheaper than New York City. Uh, and so, so uh, if there is some price decline, I would worry more about the expensive markets of San Francisco or New York City. Um, but the early warnings we will get is from actually Canada. Uh, in Canada, they don't have 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Prices actually have risen faster in Canada than in the U.S. But, but, so, I mean, U.S. prices have been uh, quite strong, but ca Canadian prices have been even stronger. But they have adjustable rate mortgage uh, because they don't have uh, the equivalents of Fannie and Freddie, and hence the 30-year fixed rate mortgage is not possible. So, uh, at some point, as the interest rates begin to be raised, uh, the homeowners in Canada, suddenly their mortgage payment rises. Why in the U.S., when Federal Reserve raises interest rate, it doesn't impact homeowners. You know, their monthly payment is all fixed. It impacts home buyers, as you know. So uh, we may begin to see some decline, early warnings from Canada first. But so far, there's no indication. And, and also, always remember, this cycle is completely different from housing bubble that happened in 2007. Back then, risky mortgages, funny subprime mortgages. We don't have that. Second, there was an overproduction by builders back then. Today, we are in multiple years of underproduction. So uh, uh, definitely in the uh, Lehigh Valley where medium prices below national average, uh, there's no worries. You know, one reoccurring question in the chat portal is foreclosures, things of that on the residential side, but also some concern of what is your forecast uh, uh, briefly on the commercial side, is, is that bubblish or, you know, what, what is the concern on the commercial side? Uh, so on the commercial, uh, it's a little mixed picture. People who are doing warehouse, they're doing fantastic. Land sales, booming, uh, because uh, either, you know, people need data centers or, you know, turn it into uh, warehouses or for home builders. So land sales are uh, booming. Uh, the retail has been difficult, uh, but it's been supported by that the small business loans, the PPP loans uh, throughout now that jobs are recovering. Uh, many uh, people are starting their new business, so retail could easily come, up, come around. Multifamily apartments, again, rental demand is popping out. 
Uh, so that looks to be on solid ground. The uncertainty is really related to office. Uh, and what we are seeing is also the trend of office leasing towards the suburbs and away from city centers. So which also indicates that Lehigh Valley could be somewhat immune uh, from those uh, office leasing collapse that's happening in the big cities. Um, and the prices on the commercial uh, have held on reasonably well uh, because of low interest rate environment. But if the interest rate was to rise, the cap rate, that's the jargon for the commercial real estate, may also rise with it, which may pressure uh, some commercial property prices to sort of level out. One last question as we wrap up. You know, talk about, you know, obviously we have these inventory challenges. I see that there's some supply chain questions here. And, uh, you know, what, what, what is your feeling on price of materials? And is this, obviously, how is this going to impact uh, this ongoing inventory challenge with builders and, and those 14 years that they haven't come out of the fog? Uh, well, uh, you know, cryptocurrency, how does that work? I have no idea how it works, but, you know, people buy on the assumption that it will be more expensive tomorrow. That's the assumption. So when the lumber prices really uh, began to skyrocket, part of it was just due to the supply and demand, but there was an additional element, speculation. People thought the lumber prices would keep going up. So they were buying just like they were buying cryptocurrency to say, well, it's, it's gonna be higher tomorrow. But that speculative element I think has come off. Lumber prices have moderated in the past week. Uh, maybe that part of the speculation is coming off. It is still higher compared to one, two years ago. Uh, and initially the builders were completely shocked at higher lumber prices. What do I do? Do I stop building or not? But the builders later quickly realized consumers are willing to pay higher price. They understand high lumber price. So they're saying, go ahead and add it on to the final price. Uh, I will still buy. Uh, and the lumber mills are uh, ramping up production. So I think the you know, prices on the lumber should be moderating and, and other uh, the uh, material cost for the construction. Interesting. I, I have one last question, and this comes from a broker. They just want to know how the, the change in the capital gains is going to affect real estate and even the investment, and, and what will that impact be uh, in, the per, in the prescribed tax code changes? Uh, you know, yeah, we are just uh, trying to illustrate uh, that all the important real estate uh, tax-related uh, issue, like 1031 exchange, don't touch it. I know the Biden administration wanted to shave that off. Uh, but we were indicating that, you know, most people who use, they're not, you know, a Donald Trump who uses that, uh, but most people who uses it are just average folks who are trying to sell their land and trying to do those exchanges, uh, make the resource allocation more efficient. So we preserve 1031 exchange. Capital gains tax, it will require some negotiation with, uh, I think, the Republican Senate and certainly Joe Manchin uh, to uh, get them. So it's unclear whether capital gains tax would rise or not. Uh, but if it was to rise, you know, it's going to impact some of the uh, sale of the, 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 the property that exceed the exemption, you know, $250,000 capital gains for the single, half a million dollar for married couple. California are very worried about that because California home prices have risen and many California homes have that capital gains. Uh, but in the Lehigh Valley, I think most people would still fall under the exemption. So, you know, half a million dollar capital gains are, are not there. And so I, don't, I think it's of a less concern, but we are still addressing and sharing information about how many home sales could be impacted from the capital gains uh, tax changes. Well, Dr. Yoon, thank you so much for being a part of the GLVR family this morning. We are blessed to have you at the NAR level. You are a wealth of knowledge and we thank you. Uh, we were blessed to have you here in person with us a few years ago. I know our chamber here was heavily impressed with all of the information and actually we put you on TV. And again, thank you so much for coming back. We will share this with the members. Uh, anything further as we conclude from you, Dr. Yun? Uh, anything more? Uh, well, thanks for having me and just uh, have a wonderful uh, day, weekend, and uh, I think your business condition for the rest of the year uh, should be on a very solid ground. Great to hear. You be safe. Thank you again. Take care.